It probably won't come as any surprise that your accent influences the way people perceive you. Very snobby, but exceedingly British. Well, it seems common sense, but for that exam you're going to need a theorist, so how about Thomas Pear, 1931? He said that people have vastly different opinions of individuals based entirely off accent. For example, Lawrence Workman found that people who said nothing were perceived to be more intelligent than those who spoke with a Brummie accent, which seems more than a little harsh, but hey, here we are. So let's just launch straight into the Brummie hating theories, starting with Dixon, Mahoney and Cox 2002, with a hilariously unfortunate set of names. Using the matched guys approach, an approach introduced by Lambert in 1960, they had participants judge whether a suspect was guilty or innocent by listening to a dialogue between a confederate and a police officer. One group listened to a Brummy suspect, the other to an RP speaker. The Brummy was perceived as significantly more likely to be guilty than the RP control. Howard Giles, 1975, had a group of students listen to a lecture on psychology, given by someone with either an RP accent or a Brummy accent. The RP speaker was rated higher on intelligence and competence after the lecture. More generally speaking, the further from RP you get, the dumber you're perceived to be. This can actually provide genuine problems for people of working class backgrounds. Trudgill, finding in 2000 that teachers perceived students with working class accents as having less educational potential. It's definitely not just been him to identify this problem either. Seligman, Tucker and Lambert, 1972, found teachers' opinions of their students across all planes was impacted by accent. Very similar to how Choi and Dodd in 1976 found teachers judged students' personalities and ability based on the way they speak. Fair enough, Trudgill did also say that RP speakers are by default seen as unfriendly, but this doesn't present nearly as much of a problem as how teachers will literally disregard students' ability based on their inflections. We've built a language system so that power is attached to RP, something Bonfiglio 2002 elaborated on, saying that language itself holds no power, only what we associate with it, power through connotation. And then Thomas Paul made the exact same point. L literally the exact same, like, that you can have two names for the price of one. So, whilst RP accents hold more power in formal settings, a regional dialect will, according to Wolfram, gain you respect and belonging in a casual setting. An example of this context dependence is that of Milroy and Milroy's 1978 study of communities in Belfast. They looked at the correlation of non-standard forms such as T8 fronting with the network strength of the community. Non-standard forms were enforced more in close groups. They shared their dialect and thus are closer. Labov's Martha's Vineyard study found the same. Looking at diphthong pronunciation in locals, they found that they exaggerate their accent in presence of non-locals as to separate themselves. A thick Belfast accent works in Belfast, but put one in the middle of a TED talk and I'm not sure you'd get quite the same reaction. The problem is no one would take you seriously, and that's not just me being a snob. The Telegraph did a survey back in 2012 of British business executives and found that 70% of them would have doubts about hiring someone with a thick Essex accent for the exact same aforementioned reason, a further 49% saying the same for a Cockney accent. Speaking of business, how about the most niche survey of all time, the Telegraph's 2012 one in which they found that a clipped home county's accent is the most comforting to hear from a pilot, whilst 34% of the thousand people questioned said Cockney was the least reassuring, followed by a Midlands accent at 25%. I can't believe that that's what people are worried about when hurtling through the air in a metal can, but alas, whilst Cockney and Estuary English will get you street cred as a young person according to Paul Coggle, it's wholly inappropriate for a job as a pilot. I think this subjectivity is summed up perfectly by Paul Coggle. He argued in 1993 that no accent is intrinsically good or bad, it's what we make of it. Like no language is intrinsically tough, yet Cheshire's Reading study found that tough young youths used higher frequency non-standard forms. On the opposite end of the spectrum, friendliness and intelligence could be associated with speech. The Daily Mail did a survey in 2013 of 4,000 people. They rated accents on friendliness, intelligence and trustworthiness. 26% said Scouse was the least friendly, while 65% said Devon was the most. RP and Devon drew for most trustworthy at 51%, whilst Liverpudlian was condemned as least trustworthy and least intelligent at 37%. I guess it's a good thing that our accents are levelling out then. Kurzweil put this levelling phenomenon down to three main reasons in 2001, the first one being the reduction of rural employment. Since the 1930s, there's been a 10% increase in city populations, meaning we're all living closer together and influencing each other in our speech. Next is social mobility. Though we do still live in a capitalist hell, the class system isn't as rigid as it once was. This means we can move around the classes and change our accents and speech patterns accordingly. Lastly is increased interaction with people of other speech varieties. 
which seems a little redundant given it's literally exactly what the other two mean, but if you need to include a third, there you go. Milroy and Milroy added another reason in 2002, geographical mobility. We're now more than ever able to move around intra and internationally, interacting with people of all different speech types. In spite of this, New Lippens Bettenhansen, 2013, found our ethnocentricity impacts our views of other speech. They tested participants for ethnocentricity and divided them into two groups. One group watched a video of a man speaking in an unrecognisable non-native accent, whilst the other group saw the same man speaking in a standard American accent. They were then asked to rate how attractive, credible and like themselves the speaker was. The more ethnocentric participants gave the non-native speaker a lower score. But I digress. Folks and Doherty, 1999, said the opposite of levelling is happening too. We aren't necessarily losing our regional quirks, but they're spreading. TH funding, that originates from the Thames estuary, has spread as far as Glasgow. It's thriving. That's it, I think. I hate this module. It's big and not very interesting. 